Four minutes past the hour. Welcome back, Tom Hart. Here with you. One of the one of the few uh, Republicans or former Republicans in this case, uh, whose podcasts I enjoy, is Joe Walsh. He's got one called White Flag with Joe Walsh. Um, uh, I believe there's like three of them out now. Uh, he can bring us up to date. It's over on Apple and other podcast providers. Uh, his Twitter handle Walsh Freedom. He's a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Illinois, the Eighth District. Former presidential candidate, the author uh, author of uh, F Silence calling Trump out for the cultish, moronic, authoritarian con man he is, and uh, now an independent. Joe, welcome to the program. Hey, it's awful nice to be with you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Back at you. Um, so Donald Trump came out yesterday and said the insurrection took place on November 3rd, Election Day. January 6th was the protest. Now, uh, you're calling this an act of war. You want to elaborate? And maybe I got over my skis a little bit, but I don't think that, again, I'm no longer outraged by anything Trump does. I believe he's a dictator. I believe he's un-American. I believe he's a traitor. Uh, in my mind, that was a declaration of war. What did he do, Tom? He attacked our elections again. He said that a democratic election uh, was the insurrection, and the insurrection was the protest. I found that statement to be an utter attack on this country, and it's pathetic that no Republican raises their voice. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Um, uh, let's talk about your former party. I'm, I'm really curious uh, to get your perspective as a former Republican of uh, exactly what the Republican Party is. And I, I'll very briefly give you my, my kind of narrative understanding of what's happened over the last 50 years. I've lived through it. Um, and and I would love to hear your take on my take, and we yeah. can also talk about the Democrats if you want. Um, you know, in the uh, roughly ten minutes we've got here, um, back in you know I, I grew up in the 1950s, and and my dad was a Republican activist, and he uh, well in the 50s, 60s, and 70s I guess by the time I was in my 20s, and. And uh, the old Eisenhower Republican Party, and for that matter, the Nixon Republican Party, um, you know, yeah. was, was committed to progress and change in America, but in a very slow and cautious way. That was kind of the definition of conservatism. All this radical stuff of, you know, the women's movement and end the war immediately and all this kind of stuff. That was too much for my dad and for a lot of Republicans. But they weren't opposed to moving forward, and they certainly were generally opposed to oligarchy in the United States. Then, in yeah. 1976, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a decision called Buckley v. Vallejo, said, okay, uh, from now on, if a billionaire wants to pour cash down the throat of a politician, that's no longer considered bribery or political corruption. That's now called free speech, and it's protected by the Constitution. Two years later, in 1978, in a, in a Supreme Court decision called, uh, called uh, First National Bank v. Bilotti, they said the same thing for corporations. And so what happened at that point in time, the Democratic Party was fat and happy with the unions. They, they, were, they were just, you know, the unions were the major source of funding. Democratic Party was like, okay, <laughs> so what? The Republicans, however, were in crisis. I mean, this is post-Nixon, right? I mean, there was talk about the Republican Party going away. And so as we went into the Reagan era, it looked to me, and I, I, I actually have documented this fairly well in a couple of books, the Republican Party basically said, okay, big corporations, okay, billionaires, we're here for sale because now the Supreme Court has legalized it. And the Republican Party became essentially the party of the oligarchs and the big corporations. And it seems like it has just gotten worse and worse and worse. Citizens United, of course, doubled down on that in 2010. And then, you know, after Reagan destroyed the labor unions in the 80s and 90s, and we went from a third of America being unionized to 9% when, when Bill Clinton became president, Clinton found himself in a crisis because the Democratic Party couldn't fund itself with the, with the unions anymore. And so the, he started the whole third way movement. Hey, let's get in bed with the corporations just like the Republicans did. Only we'll leave the dirty industries like, you know, uh, coal and oil and chemicals to the Republicans. We'll take the clean industries. We'll be in bed with the bankers and the insurance companies, you know, the white collar stuff. 
That is fading out of the Democratic Party now as the neoliberal movement is being kind of pushed aside by the old fashioned Democrats. Um, you know, thank God. Um, but the Republicans, it seems to me, are still fully in the pocket of the, the Koch billionaire network and, and, and giant industry. Am, can, am I, you know, that's my oversimplification, right? <laughs> my 50 year history yeah, in, in two yeah. minutes. Your thoughts, Joe Walsh. So uh, you and I could have a fascinating conversation on the role of money in politics and unions, and we'd probably disagree with each other on most of it. But let, but but I, I do appreciate what you said, and let me just add to it by saying this. The Republican Party basically consists of old white men and old white women, and America is becoming less white by the day. That's a good thing. The problem is the Republican Party base has never embraced it. So along came a demagogue like Donald Trump, who tapped into that ugly nativist aspect of the base. Tom, I was a Tea Party guy in Congress. You probably disliked me back when I was in Congress. I've publicly apologized for a lot of what I did to rile up the base. And the party establishment over the years ignored the concerns that their base had. Instead of educating the base that diversity is a good thing and legal immigration is a good thing, the party ignored their base. So by the time I came around and then by the time that Trump came around, man, the base was pissed off. And when Trump said, I'm going to build a wall and keep brown and black people out, he was theirs. And they clung to him, and now it is an authoritarian embracing, white nationalist embracing cult. It's a scary thing. So, uh, you know, I get that, Joe, and, and I get that narrative, but it seems to me that you're dealing with the, at the level of effect rather than cause. Um, you know, when Reagan started destroying labor unions, he started destroying the American middle class. Uh, NPR had the headline, I think the headline of the year or the decade, uh, five years ago, that 50% of Americans are no longer in the middle class. When Reagan came into office, the middle class was about 68% of America. And today it's 47% of America. So, and, and this is the direct consequence of Reagan's economic policies, particularly his taxation policies. Uh, it's also the direct result of the policies that Bill Clinton continued from Reagan. Let's, let's keep in mind, Reagan and Bush negotiated the GATT uh, which led to the World Trade Organization that Bill Clinton helped bring yeah. into being, and they negotiated NAFTA. That's why it was a big deal in the 92 campaign, was because it was the George W. Bush administration had negotiated it, Clinton signed it. And so as a result, we lost 60,000 factories, tens of millions of good jobs, and all the jobs in the communities that surrounded them. All that stuff went overseas. And people are seriously pissed off about that. And so the, the Democratic response to that has been fairly consistently, you know, I mean, Sherrod Brown has been singing this song, Bernie Sanders, forever. You know, we need, to, we need to stop offshoring jobs. We need to end this whole neoliberal experiment. It's been a disaster. Bring those jobs back home. We can't even build a damn cruise missile now without chips from China, and we're preparing to go to war with them? Really? Um, so we've yeah, got this yeah, economic but crisis, but the Republican Party's response to that, and Donald Trump's amplifying that, was... Oh, you know, it's not, it's not that, you know, our corporations that fund us have moved all our manufacturing overseas. The problem is that those black people want your jobs and those brown people want your jobs. And so you need to get hysterical about them. And I would say that's effect, not cause. Uh, but but vis-a-vis -vis the, Repu yeah, vis -vis the Republican Party, the, Rep the, the weird thing is Trump, Trump, go a lot of what you said. Oh, I it know. It was all a con. It was all a feint. He was lying when Trump said, I'm going to bring all those jobs back. I'm going to bring coal back. I'm going to bring all the industries back. It was all BS, but he was able to grab on to a lot of the working class vote simply by fooling them. I will look, I, I can't stand Trump and I think the Republican Party is dying, but the, Dem the Republican Party continues to get a greater share of the working class vote, not just the working class white vote. And Democrats need to really wake 
open their eyes to that. Oh, I, I agree with you. And, and, and like I said, I think the Democratic Party is in the process of flushing this whole neoliberal thing out, and that's a good thing, um, uh, you know, uh, step by step. But it's, it seems, to, you know, I've been running a contest on this show for 18 years. Oh, yeah. Anybody who can name a single piece of legislation that was authored by Republicans, passed through uh, with a Republican majority in the House and Senate, was signed into law by a Republican president, in my lifetime, since 1951, that principally benefits the average working people, the average working person, or, or certainly since the Reagan Revolution. Let's, let's, let's just time it at the Reagan Revolution. Um, 1981. Well, you and I, you uh, and I, my friend, I, I, I will give him an award. Well, well but nobody's but again, ever won, a, Joe. It's a. <laughs> I can name hundreds of pieces of Democratic legislation that meet that criteria. I can't name one piece of re Republican legislation while you were in Congress, before you were in Congress, or since you've been in Congress. Well, Isn't that the real again, problem? No, well, I appreciate the question, but you and I are probably coming at it from a different place. I believe that free trade policies benefit middle class america uh and i always have believed that I, because I we get we get lousy jobs but now we get cheap junk no you we we are forced to compete and we get i mean it's better for every american consumer we get better priced goods the problem is when 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 politicians like trump and others say that we can shut off the rest of the world and we're only going to buy American and we'll build a wall around America and protect all these jobs. That's all a bunch of BS. We live in a, in, 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 in a world now, in, in a free trade world now, and you can't lock up America and tell people anymore we're going to buy American. That just doesn't work. You know, in 1791... George Washington asked Alexander Hamilton, his Treasury Secretary, to come up with a plan to build, you know, to turn America into a, an industrial powerhouse. Uh, he proposed that in 1793, and Congress adopted it. Madison's, or excuse me, Hamilton's 11-point plan for manufacturers. You can look it up. Yeah. It, and, and, you know, point number one was, you know, uh, tariffs on imported goods that are not, you know, on in, imported finished goods. Um, export tariffs on raw materials. Um, subsidies for for growing essential industries. Um, you know, it, it, this that stood until 1984. I mean, you know, we had an industrial policy in the United States until the middle of the Reagan administration. In 1984 or 1983, Sam Walton's slogan at Walmart was "100% made in America." What you're well, we saying is impossible, right. Joe. Is we, what was normal in America for 200 years. Well, a fair point, and we were founded with the ability to enact tariffs, but we were not founded with a federal income tax, which came along afterwards. I'm just saying uh, it, it's a much different world now, and it's been a different world for 40 years. And it's killing and it our middle class. Well, but, but again, Tom, you, that, that if we don't compete, it will – I just don't believe the answer is to not even engage in competition. How does a company in, in, in Lansing, to, Michigan, build a wall around America? I, I'm not talking about building a wall around America. How does a company in Michigan yeah, yeah, compete with a company you. in China you, that's friend. subsidized by you. the Chinese government? I love you, my friend, but you are trying to build a wall, not Trump's stupid wall at the border. But you want to build like a protectionist wall. I do. And the, the, the genie's out of that bottle. That's not. I don't think back. so. I, th I think that is, that is why, I, you know, I, I, I lived in, and worked in China back in the 80s, and it was a very poor country. Now, you know, they've got bullet trains. I mean, they've got our jobs, our consumption has built China. How's well, that a good thing? But also, but also, China has built China. China can, China can uh, print whatever money they want to print, and they can spend whatever it's not about they money. want to spend. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They can build. They can build entire cities and then knock them down. That's what they do. Yeah.